If you live long enough, a lot of stuff will come against you. Somebody in your family gonna die. Somebody in here gonna get fired. Somebody here gonna get an eviction notice. Somebody gonna get laid off. Somebody company gonna close. Somebody you love gonna break up with you. That's life. For what you gonna do about it, though? Life has a way of humbling you. Life will make you shut up. Life will mute you. Shut you down. Because all of us, if you live long enough, will go through a period of feeling so overwhelmed that you think of one more thing, if the phone rings one more time, if I get a, another text, if I get another email, and sooner or later you feel, oh God, just get me out of this. If somebody came and knocked you down, boom, and ain't nothing you can do about it. But if I come back a week later and you're still on the ground, we got a problem. And some of you, you say, Eric, it ain't my fault. You're right. The way you were born, what happened to you is not your fault. But doggone it, you're still on the ground after 20 years? You have absolutely nothing to do with what happened to you. It's not your fault. You got knocked on the ground. You had absolutely nothing to do with that. And I'm not blaming you for that. But if I come back a week later, you're still on the ground. That's your fault. If I come back a year later, you still on the ground? That's your fault. If you get knocked down, there's nothing you can do about it. But getting back up has every single thing to do with you. And you will promise me that from this day forward, you will not be defeated. You don't belong at the bottom. And it's time for you to get your butt from down there. It's time for you to stop being comfortable at the bottom. Get your butt up and get to where you're supposed to be. The difference is not the genetic code, the potential. It's a guy that's willing to get knocked down, finally tell someone fortune, stand back up. The perseverance to see it through, the never say die attitude. And I go in there, man, and if I don't win, I showed up, I gave my valid effort. And tomorrow I'll do the same thing. And I'll continue to throw shit against the wall. Every day I'll, I'll throw more up there, try it again, try it again. And I'll never get comfortable. It's necessary that you take charge that you begin to stand up inside of yourself, that you dry your tears and you're not given the luxury of feeling sorry for yourself, that you got to get in a fighting mode. You can't surrender. You can't be a chump. You've got to fight back. You've got to stand up and start saying, wait a minute, what is it I need to do? You've got to make yourself move even if it hurts. Many people have been written off and said, this one won't survive. And they did. It's possible. You've got to believe in your heart of hearts that it's possible that you can beat this. Your belief, your faith, your drive, your determination, your persistence, your perseverance, your spirit. Greater is he that is in you than what's out here in this world. So you've got to decide, you've got to say, it's possible that I can beat this. And it's necessary that I do this. In spite of the pain and the conditions, you've got to mobilize your mind and your spirit. There's nothing as powerful as a made-up mind. You want affirmation, look yourself in the mirror and say, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can. You're built to walk uphill. And when you reach the pinnacle of the hill, you want to stop and appreciate the vision, but the next thing you want is a higher hill in the distance because it's the uphill climb that it's it's from the uphill climb that we derive our value and i mean this technically so almost all the positive emotion we feel especially the emotion that fills us with enthusiasm and that's to be filled with the spirit of god by the way because that's what enthusiasm means that's experienced in relationship to a goal and so in some sense and this is part of the religious enterprise you want a goal that you can never attain Right? So you can always move closer to the goal that recedes as you move towards it. You think, well, that's frustrating. It's like Sisyphus pushing the rock uphill. But it's not because as you pursue that goal, you put yourself together and your life does get better and richer and more abundant. And that's why the highest levels of virtue and goal are in some sense transcendent. You want them to be above everything you're doing so you can continually move towards something that's more sublime and better. That's what you are. You're, you're here to live, not to, not to sleep. And the problem with the vision of Mai Tais on the beach is that, well, first of all, that's, an that's a vision of, of drug-induced unconsciousness. 
Second, it's only going to work for about a week. Third, you're going to be a laughing stock in a month and depressed and aimless and, and goalless. It's no, that's not, it's, it's, you want a horizon of ever expanding possibility. And so it does happen to people as they, because they've staked their soul on the attainment of an instrumental goal. And it, it can be a pretty high order goal, but then you think, well, I've, now I'm there, now what? Well, the answer can't be, well, I'm going to live in the lap of luxury and never have to leave the fit. What do you want to be, a giant infant with a gold, with a gold bottle? You never have to do anything but lay in your back and suck. It's like, well, you see the problem with that as a, as a, as a conceptualization. It's no, you want to be like an active warrior moving uphill with your sword in hand. And that's, that's dynamic. That's exciting. And that's why so many young men disappear into video games. It's, that's all acted out in the video game. So they have to act that out in their own life. Not that I despise video games because I don't, but they're not a substitute for life. They might be good training under some conditions for life. See, as human beings, why? The only reason why we are dominating every other creature, including massive creatures, much bigger than us, more powerful, faster, quicker, in strength, in capabilities, why we are dominating all of them is our ability to use tools, isn't it? So do not underestimate the power of the tools. If I ask you to unscrew this screw in this furniture, you try with your hands, your fingers, your fingernails, they will all break and bleed, but the screw stays right there. I give you a little screwdriver, but you don't know how to use. You poke it here, poke it here, poke it here, poke it here. No use. Only if you put it right there and use it the way you must use it, suddenly another world, isn't it? Right now, the greatest tools that we have in our hand is our own body, our mind, our emotions, our energy. These are our tools. If you harness these tools well, you will live wonderfully. If you don't harness them, you will live badly. If these tools turn against you, you will live terrible. Right now, what is it that human beings are largely suffering? No great amount of suffering is coming to you from outside. Everything is on self-help, isn't it? Poking yourself. Why? because we gave you a sharp mind. If we had given you the brains of an earthworm, you would also be very peaceful. But to develop this level of cerebral capability, it took millions of years of evolution to get you here, isn't it? I want you to just imagine from a single celled arm waiver to make you like this, how much work. Hmm? And now you suffer this result. Essentially, what you're suffering is your own cerebral activity, isn't it? You have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough base, so it's poking you. Instead of being useful to you, it is poking you simply because this base is not stable. So one thing is to create a stable base so that this intelligence works for you. We have a huge frontal lobe, and it's 40% of our entire brain. And most people, uh, when they have a thought, they just think that that's the truth. And I think one of my greatest realizations in my own journey was just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So if you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and we do, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, and you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, your life's not gonna change very much because the same thought leads to the same choice, the same choice leads to the same behavior, the same behavior creates the same experience, and the same experience produces the same emotion. And so then, the act of becoming conscious of this process to, to begin to become more aware of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. It's called metacognition. And so then, why is that important? Because the more conscious you become of those unconscious states of mind and body, the less likely you're gonna go unconscious during the day. And that thought 
is not going to slip by your awareness unchecked because you're, it means to know thyself. And the word meditation means to become familiar with. So as you become familiar with the thoughts, the behaviors, and the emotions of the old self, you're retiring that old self. As you fire and wire new thoughts and condition the body into a new emotional state, if you do that enough times, it'll begin to become familiar to you. So it's so important, uh, just like a garden. If you're planting a garden, you gotta get rid of the weeds. You gotta take the plants from the past year and you gotta pull them out. The rocks that sift to the top that are like our emotional blocks, they have to be removed. The soil has to be tenderized and broken down. We have to, we have to make room to plant a new garden. So primarily, we learn the most about ourselves and others when we're uncomfortable. Because the moment you move into that uncomfortable state, normally a program jumps in. When that program jumps in, it's because a person doesn't want to be in the present moment and engage it consciously. So when you teach people how to do that with a meditative process, it turns out that when they're in their life, they're less likely to emotionally react. They're less likely to be so rigid and believe the thoughts they were thinking. They're more aware of when they go unconscious back into a habit, and that is what starts the process of change. And so we have to unlearn before we relearn. We have to break the habit of the old self before we reinvent the new self. We have to prune synaptic connections and sprout new connections. We have to unfire and unwire and refire and rewire. We have to unmemorize emotions that are stored in the body, and then recondition the body to a new mind and to a new motion, like deprogram and reprogram. That's the act, and it's a two-step process.